our next speaker, Simona, who you've, you've seen getting ready on the stage. Simona Cotton is just a wonderful speaker I've seen a handful of times and I've always really, really enjoyed it. The timing of this is perfect after Chris has done this kind of primer for serverless uh, to go a little bit deeper. Um, also, if you would have noticed during um, Chris's talk, there was an example, uh, one of several Sarah Drasler examples we've seen throughout the day uh, of the globe with the developer advocate teams with like the little lights on the globe tracking where they are. There was one right here, because Simona's part of that team. Uh, so she's been tracked uh, remotely. So that's kind of gratifying to see. So uh, I've seen Simona give these talks uh, about serverless and using uh, Azure functions for uh, bringing serverless to life. Uh, but we're going to go, I think, a little bit deeper into some of this today and start to look also at things like GraphQL, which is another buzz I a buzzword I haven't heard once today, which I'm surprised about. Uh, so we're going to hear a little bit about that now. So delighted that Simona could come all the way from London uh, to give this talk and join us today. So please make her incredibly welcome. Simona Cotton. Thank you. Thank you so much, Phil. And thank you, everyone, for joining my session. I'm super excited to be here. Uh, build scalable APIs using GraphQL and serverless. So this is my second time in San Francisco. Um, and it's a fantastic city. I love it. It's one of my favorite cities in the world, together with Amsterdam and London and Dublin. Uh, but one of the things that I love about San Francisco is that it's so creative. And as soon as I step out, stepped out of the airplane, I called myself an Uber. And the cool bit, the thing that really amused me and kind of surprised me uh, was the fact that my Uber car was represented as a bat. <laughs> So what did I do? I basically sat yesterday and rewrote my entire slides uh, using <laughs> a Halloween theme. So I hope you're going to enjoy that. Woohoo! <laughs> it's coming, right? <laughs> uh, and I hope that uh, everyone enjoys Halloween here. Uh, I've seen a lot of yeah fun stuff. Um, Cool. So to, uh, throughout our, our Halloween uh, and serverless and GraphQL adventure, uh, we're going to have Agnes here uh, join us and kind of try to understand uh, this mystery of what, the, what, what do GraphQL and serverless have in common, uh, right? Because they're, they seem kind of unrelated. Uh, but in fact, both of them, just as Phil mentioned, uh, are actually uh, on a hype train. Uh, <laughs> uh, and they, they're basically uh, GraphQL, they're, they're probably at the edge or at the uh, peak of their popularity uh, because um, as we speak right now, probably there's someone writing a new library either for serverless or for GraphQL that will enable us to build all the amazing stuff that Chris just mentioned. Uh, and by the way, he stole all my serverless stu uh, stuff. So you're probably not gonna learn anything new from me, but yeah, <laughs> we've seen it from Chris and that's great. Uh, so the hype train, uh, that's one thing that they have in common. Uh, the next thing that they have in common is the fact that probably um, most JavaScript developers uh, are absolutely uh, in love with them. Uh, so first of all, with GraphQL, uh, we as front-end developers are empowered to build um, applications that will require uh, the data uh, in a very meaningful way. So uh, we are empowered to shape, um, to shape that data uh, and to uh, request it just the way we need it. Um, and at the same time, with serverless, uh, we are empowered to create all those amazing applications and APIs that we were not able to create uh, in the past. So definitely, uh, GraphQL and serverless, they're super appealing to JavaScript developers. Uh, the next thing that we have in common uh, is a timeline. Uh, both of them uh, have kind of appeared around the same time. So uh, GraphQL has been released uh, into the open source uh, er early 2015, uh, and then serverless uh, probably late 2014. That's the first time when the, the term kind of started appearing as a buzzy word. Uh, and there's one more thing uh, that's super important that we're going to try to find out today with the help of Agnes uh, that connects the two together. OK, so GraphQL. <laughs> I'm going to make use of all these animations that we're not allowed to make use of normally. <laughs> so GraphQL. GraphQL uh, came to be at Facebook uh, 
around 2012 when they started rewriting their mobile applications. Um, and what they really wanted to do was to uh, define a data fetching API powerful enough to describe all of Facebook. I'll let that sink in for a second. All of Facebook. Facebook is huge, right? How do you do that? Well, it seems that GraphQL was the solution for that. Um, and if we were to look at um, my, uh, an example of what all of Facebook looks like, uh, this is a screenshot from my, uh, my uh, timeline on Facebook. Um, and the kind of data that we're retrieving here is on the left-hand side, we have information about my own user, like my, uh, my picture, my name, um, a link to my messenger, uh, some of the groups and events that I, uh, I might have been invited to. And then in the center, I have uh, the list of uh, posts that my friend have published. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, we have stories that have been published by uh, our friends, by my friends, uh, events, their birthdays, uh, and friend suggestions. So this is something that looks very sim familiar to all of you. Uh, but if we were to uh, take this and think of how would we retrieve the data from this, um, from a REST perspective. So we would probably have to make a couple of requests here. Uh, remember that in REST, everything is uh, and must be a resource and we must have uh, all the information um, returned within that, with that resource. So we would make requests like, uh, give me the information for this user based on the ID that we probably retrieved when we've logged in. Uh, also the list of events that they're gonna, they're been, they've been invited to, uh, friend suggestions, uh, and maybe uh, friend's birthdays. Uh, so a lot of requests here. Um, and if we take, for example, the uh, events uh, request, um, because given that this is a resource that's self-contained, uh, we would retrieve information like uh, what's the name of the event, Jamstack, uh, the location, San Francisco, uh, some of the attendees, uh, Phil would probably be one, and uh, his role is the chief of avocados, uh, and he has tons of fun doing that. Uh, so this is the kind of information that we would retrieve. Uh, it's a JSON object, uh, but if we look back at that page, um, we actually just need the number of events. We don't need any of that information, uh, like what's the name of the event or the list of attendees. So what does that mean? It means that uh, if we were to retrieve all that data, we would be overfetching. And overfetching means that we are retrieving data that we don't need. Uh, so that means that we are actually making our users pay for all that data that's being transferred over the wire. And while we can do, when we're on a Wi-Fi, that doesn't really matter. Uh, we all know that uh, when it comes to mobile, uh, it actually is very important, uh, especially in countries where uh, mobile data is very expensive, or in my case, where I'm actually on roaming and that data costs me a lot of money. Uh, so that's one option. We're overfetching all that data uh, for the user, so we're basically kind of stealing money from the user. Uh, or we create a new endpoint, uh, or we update an endpoint, uh, including only the number of events. And whereas that can be compel uh, compelling, uh, and that's something that most of the teams do, uh, that actually adds complexity. Because now if we've added uh, that new information to a new endpoint, uh, what we're doing now um, in the cases where that endpoint is cold and we don't need that information, we'll have to process on the front end, we're gonna have to process that data and filter out the data that we don't need. So that's one problem. The other problem is that our backend and our front end teams will now have to communicate again uh, and they kind of depend on each other. So even though the front end team uh, has finished implementing the feature, if it's not available on the back end, that means that it cannot be released. Uh, so it adds complexity uh, within our development process. Um, the other use case uh, is where uh, we have the list of uh, friends that I might, people that I might know uh, so I'm being suggested to become friends with Golnaz. Um, and from a REST perspective, that means that um, I'm making, when I, we're displaying all that data, uh, we are making a request for um, all the, the uh, a list of people that are being suggested. Uh, but you've seen there that there's also the number of mutual friends. Uh, so this means that I will have to retrieve a list of mutual friends as well so that I, I can display all that information. And this is what we call underfetching. And it's also known as the 
n plus one problem, where we're basically in order to display a single resource uh, or a common resource, uh, like uh, the, the, the person, the mutual friend, and the number of, um, no, the suggested per, uh, friend and the, uh, the number of mutual friends, uh, we have to make a request only to make other n requests, so to retrieve those uh, mutual friends. And there's two options here. We can either retrieve the list itself or we can retrieve um, each individual uh, friend. Um, and that's problematic because that means that we make tons of round trips to the server. And that means that we are uh, spending a lot of time doing that before we can actually show valuable information. So that's, that's it, not ideal for our users. Um, and the other option is either adding a new endpoint or modifying an, uh, an endpoint. Uh, and again, uh, that's not ideal because of the complexity that it brings into our team. And one of the reasons why we have to consider why over, overfetching and underfetching is it's because, because of the user experience that uh, we're, we're developing. Um, and basically, all these route, round trips, they add delay to our websites. Um, and you can see here that um, when we're um, returning data or we're displaying data in more than one second, already uh, our user is, going, is, going to, is likely going to context switch. Um, as we increase that to more than 10 seconds, uh, that the task is going to be abandoned. Uh, and even though that sounds like a, a, a very big number, uh, imagine when you have tons of resources that you are retrieving, um, you are also parsing, all that, uh, parsing out all that data that you don't need, uh, that becomes complex and uh, this can actually happen. Um, all this information comes from uh, this amazing book that I highly recommend reading. Uh, it's called High Performance Browser Networking. Um, and um, if you're interested in web performance, that's something that I um, highly recommend reading. Uh, it's available open source uh, on the web, and it's amazing. And one thing that the author of this book mentions, uh, Ilya Grigoric, is that the fastest network request is a request not made. And that's so true, right? Because we're not spending any resources there. Um, and that's exactly what GraphQL helps us with. So with GraphQL, uh, we, we're no longer in the situation where we have to retrieve data that we don't need or make more requests that, than we need. Uh, we can actually query the data that we need uh, and we can do that using uh, this type of language uh, that's specific to GraphQL where we basically define um, the query that we want to execute, so the data that we want to retrieve. Uh, in this case, we want to get information about this user with the ID one, so we'll fil we're filtering on the users that are available. Uh, and then we actually want to retrieve the name of that user, the events, but only the count for those events, uh, as well as the uh, friend suggestions with their name, uh, their mutual friends, but only the count as well. And then what we get back is this JSON object uh, that mirrors the data that we've just requested. Uh, and that's the beauty of GraphQL. We know exactly what to expect as a response to a query that we're making. So when we start working with GraphQL, uh, we, we tend to uh, have this schema-driven development approach where basically the front-end teams and the back-end teams sit together and they define the, this contract where uh, they, they define the operations required to retrieve the data. Um, and schemas are strongly typed, so uh, we have to uh, specify types for uh, the data that we're retrieving. Um, and normally we do that by using the type keyword and then uh, we give it a name. This is a custom type that GraphQL allows us to define. Uh, so we can define the type people um, and then on this uh, type we can, uh, we have fields like ID, name and avatar. Um, and you can see that um, ID, string and URL, they're types, they're uh, t types that we have available in GraphQL. Uh, so ID uh, and string are scalar types. They're uh, also known as primitive types. Um, and you can see that exclamation mark there. Uh, it says that this field is required. And then URL um, is also another way, is another scalar type, but that's a custom type. So we can do that as well, define custom types for ourselves. Uh, we can also have nested types. So in this case, uh, the team type has a list of people that will return. 
Um, and then um, we also have these uh, query and mutation types, which are essential in, uh, in GraphQL, because they allow us to define the operations uh, that we can run uh, on our data. So in this case, we can retrieve a list of teams, and that will return an array of type team. Or we can execute a mutation uh, that will allow us to increase points, uh, and we can filter that uh, on an ID and return a team type. Um, and these two are the equivalent, if you think of query, that's uh, the equivalent of the get operation. Um, and then the mutation is the equivalent of uh, the um, post or put operation. So uh, with mutations, we can modify data on the server. And with queries, uh, we can retrieve data. We can read data. Um, but here, everything is very static. Uh, so the next thing that we need to do uh, is define a behavior and define how exactly are we actually going to retrieve that data. Um, and in this case, I am calling two separate endpoints, which are two REST endpoints. Um, and these two are functions, are serverless functions. Um, and I'm just retrieving data from there um, are asynchronously. Um, so you can see the teams retrieval and then increment points there. Another cool thing with GraphQL that we have available is graphical. And we can use graphical because, uh, or we, can, we have access to graphical because um, our schemas are strongly typed. And because uh, GraphQL allows us to, uh, to do this thing called introspection, which uh, allows us to um, see exactly how our schema looks like and what operations we have available. Um, so with GraphQ, uh, graphical, uh, we can um, inspect the documentation here uh, that will tell us um, everything that uh, we've defined uh, and all the operations that are available on our backend. Um, again, with graphical, uh, we can also run operations. Uh, we can run queries uh, or run mutations. Um, and we're going to see the results on the uh, right-hand side as well. So this is very useful because we can actually test our applications. We can debug our applications using uh, graphical, and this is wonderful tooling. Um, it also allows us, gives us uh, like errors whenever we're executing queries that are uh, not valid or we're, we're using types that are not available on our server. We're going to immediately be prompted that and told that this is not correct. I don't have this available. So why would you go ahead and use GraphQL? Uh, well, because it increases the performance of our websites, um, because it allows us to query only the data that we need uh, and make a single request for that. Uh, that increases the performance of our websites. It also increases uh, our flexibility as developers, because we only uh, uh, request the data that we need. Uh, so we define that shape. Um, and then the tooling that we have available for us um, is fantastic. As I mentioned, probably as I'm speaking, someone else is building a wonderful tool for GraphQL. Uh, there's tons of things available for, uh, for us. OK, what about serverless? We've seen uh, today a lot of talks about serverless. Uh, Monica has. Uh, has talked a bit about uh, the, the benefits of um, using uh, or creating serverless applications, uh, and so has Chris. Um, and I'm going to dive just a little bit in that as well. Um, so this is something that Steve Jobs has uh, mm, probably said in 97. Uh, the line of code that's the fastest to write, that never breaks, that doesn't need maintenance, is the line you never had to write. So with serverless, we are empowered to do that. Because uh, with serverless, we, we don't have to write um, configuration files. We don't have to configure our servers. Um, and we also don't have to, um, we, we are uh, able to query third-party APIs, which means that we don't have to write code that's not specific to our application. So a simple hello world kind of function uh, in serverless um, is just this. Um, we have a, a synchronous function that receives a context and a request as a parameter. And then we can return a response object um, saying hello. Um, and then we can uh, 
run this in our local. Uh, and I'm actually going to demo this uh, if I still have some time. I think I do. Um, I'm going to demo this locally. Uh, I've created this function. Um, and I, I just want to show you this because it's very powerful. So we have our favorite IDE right here. Oh. I think we're not seeing the... Okay. So we have VS Code here, and this is, uh, this is uh, the, the Hello World function we've seen before. Um, and I also have the uh, function CLI installed in my local. And then I can go ahead and run this and debug this locally. So I can do that by uh, going to this uh, debug button and then run. Uh, and this will start the Azure function CLI. Um, and as it, that's happening, it will give me the URL that Chris was mentioning. Um, and I can access that and I can include that uh, in my local development in the website that I'm running um, just as easily. So you can see it here. Um, and then I can just click, and it should say hello. I, I didn't add any tests here, so it's hello undefined. Uh, but I can uh, say that name is Jamstack, and then hello Jamstack. Um, and the, the most powerful thing is that I can debug this here. So if I refresh my page, um, it will now break at the breakpoint that I've just added, and I can go ahead and inspect uh, these uh, variables, and I can even maybe um, step through. Uh, let's say I'm debugging this, and then um, I want to actually modify the response to say, Happy Halloween. Uh, and as I'm running this, it will say Happy Halloween. So it, it took me just maybe 30 seconds to have this function running and debugging it in our local. Uh, that's pretty impressive. Um, and I can not only run it and debug it in my local, uh, local I can also uh, deploy it using right-click deploy. So I have this extension for Azure where I can, um, I can deploy to an existing function or a function that, or create a new function. And this will tell me that, um, do I want to uh, override or do I want to maybe cancel this operation, uh, I chose to override. Um, so then the logs will tell me that this is happening uh, and it will give me the URL of the function that's available in the cloud. So this is just to give you a very quick taste of what you have available in your uh, typical environment as a front-end developer. And a colleague of mine likes to say that um, friends don't let other friends right-click deploy. <laughs> because as you might imagine, this can actually go very, very wrong. Because uh, if Phil here has written an amazing function that does tons of things, and then I right-click deploy my hello world function to exactly the same location, that's not fantastic, right? I've just overridden all his work. Um, with serverless, um, both with Azure Functions or um, Netlify Lambda Functions or many other functions, uh, we can actually implement this GitHub deployment uh, and kind of hand back to um, Monica's uh, presentation where we implement the uh, continuous integration flow. Uh, so we have all of that available for us. Um, I just want to make sure that this has finished deployment. That's correct, I have this function here, uh, this URL, and then I can pass in the name Jamstack, um, and there you go, it's in the cloud. Woohoo! Woo <laughs> that was very shy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, but uh, the true power of serverless is not just being able to create functions uh, and the, the code that we write in functions, it's actually the data sources that we can connect to and the third party APIs that we can call, to, we can call into. Um, and this is just an example of how, uh, uh, of things we can connect to using Azure Functions, things like um, static storage or, or databases uh, or even like files that we have um, on OneDrive. Um, and to access this, we need to define in a JSON file um, just the, these 
six lines of code uh, that allow us to define the type of connection, the type, where are we reading the data from, um, and also uh, the connection string setting, that's very important, that defines, that allows us to connect to that uh, data source. Uh, and then in order to use it in our code, we only need the single line where we're accessing that particular object that we've defined in the JSON object. So I think that's very powerful. Um, so why would we use serverless? Well, because it enables us to create reusable APIs, and that's part of Jamstack, right? Reusable APIs. Um, and then it, we can also use our, our, lo our typical environment, um, like VS Code, to develop and debug and also deploy, but that's not recommended. Um, and we also have easy integration with uh, other data sources. And finally, there's no servers to manage. <laughs> <laughs> Shall I do that again? <laughs> so GraphQL and serverless <laughs> together. Um, when serverless started, uh, we tend we, we, we used to have a either a microservice or a monolith, uh, and we slowly migrated to very small functions that used to execute um, things in the background. Not very risky there. Um, as we moved on and time passed by and more communities adopted serverless, uh, we started being much more um, uh, brave and we implemented more and more functionality of our project um, in serverless functions. Um, and nowadays, it kind of looks like this, where you have your, your mo microservice and your monolith uh, is somewhere there and then there's tons of functions uh, that implement different types of functionality. Um, and while this is super great and it enables us to build amazing stuff, it's also super confusing because you have things all over the place and it's hard to manage and it's hard to uh, kind of have uh, a clear idea of where things are. And that's what GraphQL helps us with. It helps us to add that single interface and that single endpoint uh, where we can query uh, and we can understand how our API looks like. So then to add GraphQL into our functions, uh, what we need to do is to use a GraphQL uh, JavaScript module, and this is just because I'm using uh, Node.js um, functions, but you can use other languages as well. Um, and then um, we, we use a GraphQL uh, entry point to um, validate queries and to execute them. Um, and the only required uh, parameters here are the schema and also the um, the request, the actual request. And then we return uh, whatever GraphQL uh, has retrieved for us. So right here we have a browser um, and then the GraphQL endpoint can call into um, maybe two functions or more functions um, and those go and retrieve data from a database. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to be like that. With GraphQL we can directly query uh, our database um, as well as query from other REST endpoints. And not only that, we can actually add uh, a caching, um, a caching layer before querying into our database, uh, in this case Redis, but you can use other caching resources. Um, and we, we would do that just to add more performance. And GraphQL is really powerful when we have different clients calling into our endpoints uh, because they, they use different data sources and they use different shapes for our data. So why, what, what are the serverless and GraphQL type of advantages? Well, with serverless we get easy integration of data sources. With GraphQL we get easy abstraction of data sources. Uh, with serverless we get auto scalability, so uh, from one user to a million users um, there will be enough servers for us to respond to those users. And with GraphQL, we get a single endpoint uh, that will allow us to query all kinds of data. And with serverless, we write less code because we can reuse all these APIs that are available for us. Um, and with GraphQL, we make a smaller number of requests because we can define, we can request all the data that we need uh, in a single request. So truly what GraphQL and serverless have in common is increased developer productivity. They allow us to 
um, do all these, build all these amazing APIs um, by just combining them together. So we can achieve more by doing less. This is something that um, I've, Monica has uh, brought, brought into her presentation as well. Um, so I think that's very important uh, for the lazy developer, and not only. That's what all we should strive to be. So I encourage you to go build something with GraphQL and serverless, and do share that with me, please. Thank you.